for Jesus, things impossible, impossible for you. Yes, Lord. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, that all belongs to you. Amen. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Proclaim it. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. When I fight, I fight on my knees. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God. Battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. God is good. And all the time, amen. We are here for him this morning. Let's lift up our praises. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be your sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. Jesus. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open, now sing your is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let us shout, let us shout. Be the anthem, your renown, fill the skies, we are here for you. Amen. Jesus, we are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead. Come to life, we are here for you. We 
are here for you. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one Jesus. Only you are holy. Only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Welcome him with praise this morning, church. We welcome you. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise, we welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this We welcome, we welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Yes, Lord, we thank you that you're here among us, that you've tabernacled among us, and that you are good, and all the time you are good. We lift you up this morning as a church family, celebrating your faithfulness and your goodness in this time. We love you, God, and ask that you'd be glorified. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to Horizon South Bay. Please take the time to greet uh, those around you. Good morning again, Horizon South Bay. Uh, I don't know about that. Fearless, maybe, because I'm here, (laughs) right? Hey, uh, just an update on, uh, if you don't know, um, the Martin family has uh, tested positive for COVID, so we want to keep them and their family in prayer. I talked to them yesterday. They're doing fine. As far as um, how they feel, it's just like saying they have mild flu symptoms, but um, they're doing okay. So I just wanted you to know, give you an update with that. Pastor Norlin, um, he's under the weather today. Jim is going to be filling in. Thank you, Jim. And just because I sound funny, it doesn't mean I'm sick. I just have a sinus infection. So now that I've got all this cleared up, yeah, good morning again. Welcome. A couple announcements. If you uh, have your bulletin, we'll go over those. Um, We did set aside the last three rows for uh, mask only. So um, if you're watching online and you're still feeling a little bit 
uh, uncomfortable, you can either go into the room, we have a separate room where um, you wouldn't have to be around the major um, body here in the, in the sanctuary. And then we also have the last three rows just designated for masks only. So just to kind of uh, bring you up to date. Let's see, we have uh, Jesus Revolution. That is a new study, the combined study on Wednesday, starting this Sunday or Wednesday. Normally we have the men's fellowship, but we're, we're combining them. And this is the book here. It's uh, by Greg Laurie, and it's six weeks. There is a workbook. If you're interested in the workbook, I think there's five left. Um, let me know or let my wife Sue know, and she can get you one of those. California Healthy Youth Act. That is um, coming up soon here on the 8th, here in the evening of the Sunday the 8th. I just can't stress this enough. Please uh, take advantage of this, uh, this moment of time that we have some people that worked in the public school system that can tell us exactly what's being taught in the, in the public school system. Um, actually, one of them helped implement what is being taught. And you will be amazed what the kids are being exposed to. And so what this is is educating the parents and their children and also giving our children, our kids, um, something to, um, a, a resources where they will understand that they can um, apply their decisions on what they think based on God's principles and biblical principles, not on what they're being told in the public school system. All right, August 8th, 6 to 8. Um, we have baptism Sunday, August 29 at Crown Point. So if you're, anybody's interested, let us know at the church office so we can put you on that list. And last but least, uh, there's a little mistake in the back of the bulletin. Um, Barclays uh, Home Fellowship says on the back um, on break, but they were actually will be meeting next week uh, at his house. And again, if you're visiting or if you're watching online and you're not familiar with who we are, check our website. All the information that you need is right on there, all the home fellowships and all the things that are going on. Let's pray for today's service. Thank you, Lord God, that that we're here and that you're here with us. And Lord, we ask you, Father, to just uh, rain down upon this place, rain down upon our hearts, your Holy Spirit, that you would open up our minds and our hearts and our souls to what you have to say in your word. And you would just anoint Jim, Lord, as he um, opens up your word and teaches, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. Bless our talks and offerings, God, and, uh, and, be, and bring you glory here at Horizon South Lake. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm good here. All right. You can tell we're shorthanded. We're all scrambling for things. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Thanks for not being sick today and coming. <laughs> if you turn to Romans chapter 1, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I'm finishing up for Norlin. He won't be back. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, the older I get, the less I know. Uh, anybody ever play with a yo-yo before? They used to be great fun. I was looking at the and downs. Um, I was looking at some old figures in 98, annual sales top 50 million, and I don't see yo-yos much these days. In case you were wondering, the word yo-yo comes from Tagalog, which means come, come. Did you know that? That's why you come here, to get this kind of information. Um, uh, yo-yos have gone high tech. They uh, Yesterday you had well, when I, yesterday, a long time ago, when I was a kid, it was just wood and string. Remember waxing the string, get a candle and that kind of stuff? That was kind of fun. And then the latest ones I saw have like transaxles and light, all special things that make them very nice. Uh, some even have like clutches. But these fads and crazes, they come and go. Just like tops. Remember tops? <laughs> Love those too. But yo yo's. Um, will always be present among believers in Christ. Not as a toy, but as an illustration of our lives. Up and down, up and down, up and down. 
How many ups and downs have you experienced as a Christian? <laughs> Today, uh, does your spiritual life look like a, like a perpetual yo-yo? Up and down, up and down. How steadfast and stable are you? When I first became a Christian, um, I was kind of, this is such a long time ago, when poodles roam the wild, wild poodles roam the earth. Um, the, I became a Christian, and I'm basically an introvert, and I felt like I was kind of moody. And so, you know, depending on, you know, if, if I sinned, I'd like crash and burn for, you know, three days. And I did have a Catholic upbringing, so I felt like I really needed to punish myself for like three days. So that worked out really well. Uh, so that was ingrained in my head. And eventually it came to a point where I didn't want to see this in my life. I wanted to, the, the picture in my brain, and I actually this is how I work, was I would cl climb in my life as a Christian, progress in my life. If I started to find myself sinking, I would hold on to that step, hold on to that ledge until it passed, because it always passes. And then, when things are better, I'd start progressing again. And so that kind of got away from this, and it became more of this, like stair steps. Um, are you a man or woman of integrity and servanthood? I ask lots of questions. Uh, is your growth in Christ steady? Are your eyes firmly fixed on Jesus? Have you felt like your walk with Christ has too many ups and downs? Have you been a yo-yo? There are three dynamics in Christian growth. There's discipleship or servanthood. There's understanding and yielding to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And there's the koinonia principle of, of us gathering together as Christians in fellowship uh, where we affirm one another, we're accountable to one another. Uh, and our growth is a reaction to God's action towards us. God's grace, that's his action towards us. Uh, we, we could not merit his love. It was an absolute gift. Uh, so that action is totally God. We can't, we, our fingerprints aren't, aren't on that at all. Uh, he saves, he enables, he redeems. It's all of God. And, and even our response towards God is a gift from him. We can't even claim how cool it is that we responded to God. God's action or grace, it demands a response from us. Here's this. What are you going to do with it? This is grace. What are you going to do with it in your lives? And response to God is discipleship or servanthood, growing in Christ, sanctification. Basically, it's saying to the Lord, I commit to you without limit, a total commitment as you totally committed to me at the cross. It's not like, I, I sort of like you, Jesus, so I'm going to follow and see how it goes. And that's why we need the daily filling of the Holy Spirit because of this commitment. We falter and fail. And it's an experience of being filled with, influenced, and, and controlled by the Holy Spirit. We see that throughout Scripture. Many people have come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And when they start living the Christian life, sometimes it goes, everyone said it's going to be great, but it's not. We've been doing that. Or you have something, I was, listen, I was listening to the Jesus show this morning. Somebody called and, and was saying, you know, uh, this bad thing happened and this bad thing, I'm not blaming God, I've been a Christian, I, I'm following him, but this bad thing, why is this happening to me? And we all go through that. Um, and when we have that kind of an attitude, and, and lots of people think this way, God is, God is here for me, but it's not that at all. Uh, we... We want heal me when I'm sick, give me money when I'm poor, uh, burp me, change my diaper, whatever, whatever category you fall into. And if that's the game that you're playing, uh, you're wrong. It's ultimately a very dissatisfying Christian experience to find out 
God, what have you done for me lately? And we need to get past that. God is not a gimmick, that, and we can't manipulate him. He's not like a, a heavenly slot machine. We put in a quarter, and we, and we expect God to dump money into our experience there. If we do that in our Christian walk, we'll be a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. Now, every Christian came to the door of salvation with words that said, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was the entrance to the door. Everyone was welcome. Some of us came by fear. Some of us had, had hell scared out of us. Others came from a positive side looking for purpose and meaning in their lives. And, and still others kind of slipped in the back door because of, I don't know, uh, addictions. And, and they got involved with the AA and found out what the, who the higher power really is, being Jesus. But everyone saw whosoever will. And that was the invitation. Whosoever will. And we came. It's a teaching that emphasizes receiving Jesus as Savior and then at some later point, taking him as Lord. Don't kid yourself, they're the same. They come together. Jesus is Savior and Lord at the same time. In order to deal with Jesus as Savior, you must recognize him as Lord. How can he be your Savior if he's not? Now, it's true that we take him as Lord when we're saved, and then an another time later, we or maybe throughout your entire Christian life, you come to grips with what that lordship really means in your life. Uh, we renounce every other hope of salvation and any other attainment save the grace of God. Total, this is the only, only way, only way we can get to this. We are helpless without our Savior. We are absolutely spiritually bankrupt without Him. We pass through the door of salvation, John 3.16. Now what happens? Usually, we go, whoopee, for like six months. We're so excited. It's a great day. And, and, and some of us want to go, whoopee, for our lives. And that's okay. Um, the only thing in those initial stations of, uh, of whoopee, you don't settle in to who you are in Christ and what your purpose is. The Holy Spirit will stop you at some point and say, all right, all right, Jim, we're glad that you're glad, but let's get on with it. I need you to move along. Hey, turn around. I want to show you something. And then he points to the other side of the door on the inside to show you a family secret. It's never revealed to the outsider. And it's probably the most important scripture to be memorized by by somebody who comes to Christ after the warm religious goosebumps. It says almost the opposite of what was written on the outside. Turn to Ephesians 1 4. Are you there? <laughs> it says. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. You can't lay that on a, a new Christian, somebody coming in the, or just coming into the door. That's not the salvation invitation. Um, but you must be born again in order to live like that because it takes the influence of the Holy Spirit. It takes Christ in you to live that way, to be chosen in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. So not only did God choose us, but it says he chose us for himself. That's the whole purpose there. He initiated the relationship. He did not choose us to be happy and healthy and wise. We weren't chosen to be healed when we're sick, to be given money when we're poor, to be gotten out of every scrape that we get into. We were chosen for God himself that we should glorify him and walk before him in love. 
That's what we were chosen for. Until we get out of our, our self-centered orientation, and it's not everywhere, but it's a, an American Christian experience where, you know, if we're not happy somewhere at this church, they offended me, we go somewhere else. Uh, if you live in another country that's persecuted, you don't have that option. And they are very serious about their walk with Christ. I'm not saying you're not. I'm just laying down uh, what is. Um, so then um, the Holy Spirit, then he points downfield like a goal. And he says, what do you see? What do you see? There's the goal. There's the ultimate lesson. That's the every person needs a purpose, and he's pointing at it. Uh, there's without something filling us. There's a vacuum. Every vacuum demands a reason for existence and sucks things in to find out what it is. So let's look at what the goal is. Turn to Romans eight twenty nine. Yep, can't get away from Romans. Romans eight twenty nine. You there? It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Do you see that? That's a goal. That is the goal. The Holy Spirit says, that's what it's all about. Now let's get started. Let's move in that direction. Um, being conformed to the image of Jesus. Wow, that's light. So here, here you are, advancing toward the goal. The first 20 yards, it's crowded with wall-to-wall -wall Christians. But as you move down the, full, down the field, you get closer to the goal, you start to have lots of elbow room. There's a lot of people like hanging around the door they entered. They don't go downfield and have a, a life that falls under the discipline of the Holy Spirit and, and the growth and, and the conforming to Jesus, the image of Jesus Christ. It's a lack of maturity. Um, I was texting somebody yesterday, and they said, uh, so what are you going to talk about? I said, um, mature Christian living. And I said, and not just for elderly people. <laughs> and they said, they said, well, the, the for mature Christians is loss of hair, uh, <laughs> just start naming off all kinds of stuff like that. So anyways, uh, it's not a lack of power in our lives. It's a lack of purpose in getting our eyes off the goal. Do you remember when Peter stepped out of the boat? Same principle. His eyes were on Jesus. He was walking on water. And then he starts to hear the wind blow. And he sees the waves. And it dawned on him, I'm walking on water. Uh, I'm supposed to any and Jesus had to take care of things there. The Holy Spirit wants you to come to turning a choice of will to pursue the image of Jesus Christ, to be like Jesus. It's, it sounds super spiritual, kind of ethereal in the air. I want to be like Jesus. Well, what does that mean? The image of Christ is very practical. Well, first of all, we never learn really solid lessons on the mountaintop. We learn them in the valley. You agree with that? That's where we learn these things. Uh, the more we know about Jesus, the more we know about our goal of being conformed to the image of Christ. And that means you as a Christian, every day, draw close to Christ. And, the, and just by proximity, uh, you know how, you've probably seen it and you've mentioned it before, um, mentioned it before uh, somebody with their pet, like an old guy, uh, they always seem to have like a bulldog and they have kind of jowls in their face, and the two of them look, well, it's because they've been together so long. I've heard that married people do that too. All of a sudden, um, so it's like that. So if you're with Jesus all the time, you start to look like Jesus because you're hanging around really good company. And Jesus took a temporary form in which he glorified God. In Ephesians 2, the kenosis passage it says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, 
uh, it, he emptied himself. That's what the uh, kenosis means, an emptying, or he made himself nothing for us. He took the form of a slave, a doulos, doulos in Greek, a bond slave. And there are two words that describe a bond slave real good. A bond slave is irrevocably and unconditionally united. I like, I use the word doulos a lot in Um, so that's the the person I want to be. Yeah, I know that was funny. You're the only one left. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I found that in college. I discovered that word, and I, and it, it just really sticks in my heart to be that kind of person, a bond servant for Jesus. No, I'm not a. Uh, rarely do I. Uh, achieve that goal every day uh there's like maybe seven seconds a day where i really feel like i nailed it out and just to prove it i got humbled um so a servant likes to serve not to be served a servant has no plans for his own life his concern is the master's plan uh, the servant in a in a hall of a king and all these royalty and people and visitors like that, he's not so much looking for this interaction here. He's keeping his eye on, this, on the master. Like, what do they think about me? Here's the servant. Eyes are on the master. What does the master want from me? And that's a good place to be. A servant lives through the will of another. The servant is satisfied. Um, our decisions are run through the master. Jesus, what would you tell I mean, they're all important. It's all important. The focus is on Jesus. Obedience is the bending of our will toward And that's the main for us as servants of God, as servants of Christ, is is bending our will or being obedient. Ruth Culkin. And she's in that book, and she writes, I wonder. This is what she says. You know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. And you know how eagerly I speak for you at the women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew. That's a servant's heart. They're not interested in accolades, being noticed. They're content for one thing. They're serving Jesus in whatever corner of the world that is. If we are to be conformed to the image of Christ, we must be what he was lives to conform to the God's destiny for us, there has to be a clear understanding of that relationship of servant and master. We all like being sons and daughters of God. We're very comfortable with that. But we must also be servants. And we can't understand our sonship until we understand our servanthood. And I'm preaching this too. Where is our heart in all of this? People have to have a purpose or a goal. It's inside us. And and only God can satisfy that need for the relationship with the Lord. Not just take a sip on a on a thirsty day, but to chug a lug, Jesus. More of him. More of him. I want to 
want to spend more time with Jesus. I want to walk around, um, well, brother, practicing uh, the presence of Christ. Every, every minute of every day to be that. Um, I don't want to join a spiritual bless me club that kind of satisfies the, ourselves. If, if I'm doing that, I'm missing the dynamics of Christian living. Jesus did not die to make life easy for us. Jesus died for us to save us, to save us for him. Salvation was not brought to make us feel good and escape hell and go to heaven. It does. Those are incidental blessings. But it's that relationship. And God comes to us and he says, you are my beloved. I want you here with me. And all the stuff that we do comes after that. But it's that relationship first. Salvation was meant to deliver us from selfishness, self-centeredness, and having that big ego. Salvation was meant to make us men and women who live and are guided by a divine purpose. And it has to be stamped deep in our character. And the way that happens is we spend time with Jesus. The final exam won't be based upon American Christianity about what God has done for us, but what we have done for him. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 says, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now this isn't a judgment of sin, because that's covered at the cross, but of our works. Now, 1 Corinthians 3 says, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. He himself will be saved. So we have this, all have the same foundation of Jesus, but what's built on it? How can we be so blind and fail to understand the sincere and great responsibility that is ours as believers? I know that this seems kind of heavy, but it's where our hearts are. Uh, weeping is the sound we expect to hear from somebody who is damned and going to hell, but we will weep when our works are judged before God. Have my works been so few and so poor that it amounts to a pile of grass that's just going to be lit on fire? Dross will be burned away, but what is good? The works we did, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, um, they, will re they will be revealed. So what happens if you think about today if God drops a torch? And I like thinking in pictures. Here's my foundation, Jesus Christ. And here's my life and the things I've built. Works. And some of it's good. But I'm thinking a great portion of it is straw, hay, old grass. Stuff I did with, bat, uh, with impure motives or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, Self, selfishly to be noticed or something. So I built this this hut. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a little better than a hut. Um, and then we go before the Bema Seat, Judgment of Christ, and pff, it's lit up. And all of a sudden, there's some spots that are, wow, there's some gold, and, but there's big old holes. It's just been set on fire and burned up, and so now what do I have left over? So that, that grieves my heart. But, but the good thing is that now you're building on this foundation and the Holy Spirit convicts you about some of the straw or hay that you have added to this thing, the cheap material, and I can deal with it now. I can confess and receive the forgiveness of the Lord and... He comes up and restuccos it for me. So now it's not going to be so bad because I'm living this life of continually growing in Christ and receiving his forgiveness and trying to change and letting the Holy Spirit have his work in me. So, so now it's not as horrendous as I think it's going to be when I come to that judgment of works. 
We're taking care of business now. So remember to do that. Take care of business now. So understand the ultimate purpose of your life. It and you are that important. And a true purpose can only be found in matters that have eternal significance. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So that's the whole principle of taking care of this stuff now. Being transformed by the Holy Spirit now. And this is the purpose of every believer, to live every day of your life as a bond slave with the goal of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. All that stuff, all the decisions that you make during the day, if it's based on that, you're going to do fine. No more ups and downs. A steady forward growth in Christ. Say no, no to the yo-yo, okay? But every day is a day of decision. Joshua 24, 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which you were beyond the when, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Anybody have that sign in your house? It's very popular. There you go. So today, will you serve the Lord? Is that what your heart is telling you? We're either pursuing some personal goal or the goal of Christ's likeness of being like Jesus. All the other things fall under a personal goal. Colossians 1.10 says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's important. Walking in the manner of the Lord, worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge. What a, what a great prayer request that is for us this morning. And do you want to know a secret about serving? Oh, please don't say no. <laughs> say yes. Because I'm ending it if you don't say yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's not really about doing. All this servanthood talk, uh, maybe you felt like burdened now, like I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and, and it becomes difficult. It's about being. All that we do for the Lord should come out of our being with and in Christ. Being. It's always about being before doing. Always. Doing without being is a losing proposition. Having a servant's heart begins with being with Jesus. And I'm saying this to me because I am like so task oriented. Um, so I'm, it's just, and then it, if we come in and we're shorthanded in here, we become multitask oriented. And it's like, where's the joy in all of this? So then I have to spend time being quiet and remember what's really going on here. But having a servant's heart begins with being with Jesus. Remember the story about Mary and Martha in Luke 10? Good example. They were sisters, but with different priorities. Martha was upset at Mary because she's working and serving, while Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Little Mary. That's <laughs> cute. Okay, so Martha um, is getting a little upset that she's not getting any help in the kitchen. Mary, she's basking and being with Jesus. Well, Martha couldn't because she's busy cooking and cleaning. So from the New Living Translation, it says, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was serving. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come here and help me. And the Lord said to her, now you would think, yeah, that's true. You're doing that all by yourself. Mary, go over there and help. No, Jesus said, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. That brings tears to my eyes. That's amazing. Now, granted, people have to eat. 
I understand that. But Mary's heart was to sit at the feet of Jesus. Not because she was lazy and didn't want to, this is a great way to get out of work, uh, but because she loved the Lord. And all the other details, they would get worked out. Work done for the Lord that isn't nourished by a deep walk with Jesus will eventually exhaust you. It's a really important sentence. I'm going to say it again because I wrote it because it's really important. Work done for the Lord that isn't nourished by a deep walk with Jesus will eventually exhaust you. If you're not spending time with Jesus, your sense of being will shift from who you are in Christ to what you've done for Christ. And that's a wrong thought process. Uh, you you fall into a performance during Christianity that, that will absolutely lead to failure because you'll be working in the flesh. I, um, I was raised, uh, my father was an alcoholic. And my parents would fight. So as a kid, I thought if I did everything just right, then there'd be peace in the household. And I was the oldest of three, three boys. And that was... That's always been there, performance and type A firstborn child. Uh, in there, I needed to perform. If I did everything just right, then things would work out. Well, guess what? Things did not work out. I, as a kid, was frazzled trying to make everything smooth. And it's the same way as a, as a Christian. If you're working so hard that you're missing out on spending time with Jesus... It's going to fail. Uh, peace, clarity of vision, joy, that'll all start disappearing because your focus becomes on the work and not on the relationship. I can't tell you how important it is that this relationship you have with Jesus Christ is the, the main focus, being with him, and then you'll be like him, abiding in him. What you do, it's, it's important. The things that everybody, the guys that came in early, doing something, that's all important. But if that foundation of being with Jesus isn't there, doing has come before being, and we need being before doing. Do not let your doing for Jesus get ahead of your being with Jesus. If you're in that position and you're doing stuff around, come tell me and I'll say, go take a break. Go, do, go be with Jesus. And then it will come from the right heart. Abide in him. There's a chapter about that. Abiding in the vine. I took these indicators from Peter Cazero. These are ten indicators that say your doing is exceeding your being. See if these any of these hit you. I can't shake the pressure I feel from having too much to do in too little time. Have you been there? I am ignoring the stress, anxiety, and tightness in my body. Have you been there? I am concerned with what others think. I am awful, often fearful of the future. I'm always rushing. I am defensive and easily offended. I am preoccupied and distracted. I fire off quick opinions and judgments. I feel unenthusiastic about or threatened by the success of others. I spend more time talking than listening. And any of those ring a bell? Yeah. That's an indication that your doing is exceeding your being. And all of us, we need to make sure we're being before we're doing. If they ring true in your life, your relationship with the Lord has become blended with what you do for the Lord, and the two almost become indistinguishable. Doing has exceeded being. Uh, in that case, if you think about it, then all of a sudden doing becomes your God. You're serving doing. You're not serving Jesus. It's so important. Being comes before doing. Uh, it's time to sit at Jesus' feet. The only one thing worth being concerned about. That's what Jesus said. Be still and know that he is God. 
when we're able to get in that place, all the doing stuff will come naturally and flow out of our relationship with Jesus and not the other way around. Our service will become an act of love for our Lord and Jesus will be at the center of the things that we're doing. And once your being is before your doing, how about this? You can enjoy communion with Jesus even in the midst of disappointments and storms in your life from being with Jesus. You will experience a lack of anxiety in your body just because you're with him. Uh, you, um, this is kind of important too. You won't do for others what they can and should do for themselves. You won't feel that you have to be the Messiah and the rescuer. I know that kind of feels counter to some of the things but doing comes after being. Uh, you can maintain being with Jesus in seasons of great pressure. You're less triggered when things go crazy. You don't freak out. You can enjoy and appreciate uh, the wonder of those people around you. Uh, you're not so thinking of other things. You're able to focus. You will enjoy a deep sense of knowing you have nothing to gain and nothing to lose, wanting only God's will, because your heart is focused in on what God wants in your life. It's not focused on the other things about gaining or losing. Or it's You're just loving Jesus and following him in the things that you do. You will have a deep contentment in caring for the people God has entrusted to you because you're resting in Jesus as you do all this. You're abiding in Jesus your being instead of doing. You will receive God's gift of limits. This is important to me. Julie's always tell, telling me, uh, you need to set some boundaries here. You can't do all that. Uh, you receive God's gift of limits rather than fighting, ignoring, or denying them. You recognize, like, coming to church, like, we're, we scramble and, like, we need to do this, this. And I'm just like, no, we can't do everything. We will do what we can do. And enjoy our relationship with Jesus because that's where the focus is. And we can discern and embrace the season, whatever that is in your life, in which God has placed you. And you don't freak out about you know, this time of your life when this is going bad or, you know, it's not a matter of that. Because you're abiding in Jesus. And then you'll find peace in all of that. And... Um, I'll close with this. Jesus prayed for you in John 17, 21. Did you know that? It's the high priestly prayer. And Jesus prayed this, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, you can insert your name there, also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. He doesn't say that, that they are doing this and feeding the poor and I don't know what else. Babysitting. Um, John 17, 21. Just as you, Father, are in me and I on you, that Jim also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Put your name there. I'm going to read it one more time. When I reach they, you're going to say your name out loud. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. That, that's your being in Christ. And all the doing will flow out of that. And you can have peace. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, these words from Scripture are just so moving to me. It realigns my whole day when I recognize who I am and not what I'm doing and who we are in Christ. And I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice that they'd recognize the same thing abiding in Jesus, abiding in you where we find peace and strength. They were not moved by circumstances and what we're doing specifically, 
but that we're serving you, but first we're being in you, in Christ. We recognize that we belong to you, that you saved us for a purpose, that our hearts are united with yours, that our wills are being conformed to your will, that you are making us more like Jesus every day. And we all desire to draw close and to spend time with you, that our relationship with you would flourish and grow, that our deepest heart of hearts would be yours. And everything that we do would be um, would come out of that relationship. That we would not sweat doing so much. But we would be like Mary. And we know that eventually we'll get to the kitchen and help out. But we want to sit at the feet of Jesus because that's where our heart really is. And all the doing is just a reflection of our being in Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for these words that once again remind us what our true calling is. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Jim, for that encouragement. Let's be with the Lord now as we praise him. And sing, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high that the battle belongs to the Lord. And if you need prayer this morning, we have Mike and Julie to partner with you in prayer now. So let's proclaim his praises together this morning, church. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. 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 Grace and peace be with you. Be with Jesus now.